Before I move into the message of today, I just wanted to point out that there are three roses on the altar today, on the communion table. The red rose is for Adrian David, another one with David in his middle name, who was born to Trey and Kristen Blanks and Brother Dominic this week. We celebrate Adrian's arrival in this world. It is great to have him here. The two white roses are for Reverend Earl Fritz and for Donise Wooster. Uh, Reverend Fritz died this past Sunday on All Saints Day, and his service of thanksgiving and memory was yesterday. For 66 years, Earl was a pastor, a pastor who gave his life to others. He was an amazing gift to all of us. And Donise was a deacon of this church. She died much too young. She died of cancer on early Friday morning with her sons, with her family by her side. And one thing I, I was thinking about each of them is they were amazing stewards in this season of stewardship. Uh, both of them would talk about how they would give to others, how they would share with others. And they didn't do that to draw attention to themselves. They did it because of the generosity of their heart. And we're in the midst of our campaign forward together. If they were here and they are in spirit, they would be our greatest teachers on how to nurture and engage and encourage. And so let us remember that to step up and to move forward together is a calling for us as stewards of God's gifts to us. As we remember Earl and Donise and we celebrate Adrian, uh, let us pause in a moment of silence. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Samuel, the son of Elkanah and Hannah, is born into this world as one who is dedicated to God. His arrival is an answer to his mother's deepest prayer. Hannah has struggled through barrenness to birth Samuel, and you might call him an extra special change agent of God. Samuel becomes a light to the nation Israel and becomes the one who will lead them from their long exodus journey that they have been on for a while where they've had judges leading them and uh, a hodgepodge of leadership structures. He will lead them from that to the first real monarchy of the nation and then to the rule of King David. Samuel is the pivotal person in Hebrew scriptures whom God chooses to carry God's nation through chaos to clarity. But it is the faithful prayers of Samuel's mother, Hannah. That touch, the heart of God, that bring about Samuel's conception and birth. Elkanah is a man with two wives, Peniah and Hannah. Although he loves Hannah deeply, at times he's rather indifferent to her pain and the painful condition of not being able to bear and carry a child. She's struggling deeply with infertility, and he doesn't seem to get it or care. While Hannah is barren, Peniah has sons and daughters. Year in and year out, Peniah verbally abuses Hannah for her barrenness. She openly humiliates her, especially when they go to Shiloh to bring blessings and offerings to the Lord. Hannah is one that we meet in this moment who is weeping in sadness as she is unable to conceive and birth a child. But in her absolute faithfulness, she knows she is not alone. She appeals to God to grant her a blessing, to give her a baby. 
and out of her intense pain, she prays intently. As Hannah prays, we meet the fourth person of this story, Eli, the priest. He is aging. He is increasingly feeble. As he presides over the temple at Shiloh, it's pretty clear he's lost his edge. As he sees Hannah's lips moving with no words coming out, he supposes her to be drunk. Apparently, intense pain can present itself as drunkness. So he chastises her for being drunk. But Hannah leans in. She says, oh no, sir, please. I'm broken hearted. I haven't been drinking. Not a drop of wine, no beer. The only thing I've been pouring out is my heart. I've been pouring out my heart to God. It's because I'm so desperately unhappy and I'm in such pain that I've stayed here so long to pray. When Eli hears her cries, he changes. He softens. He says, My dear, go in peace. And may the God of Israel give you what you have asked from him. The God of Israel, our God, delivers. God delivers an answer to prayer. God delivers Hannah's son, our fifth and central character in this story, this unfolding saga. This saga has shown us a lot of things in just a short amount of time. In just a few verses of Holy Scripture, it has shown us hostility from one woman. It has shown us indifference from a husband. It has shown us brokenheartedness and faithfulness and prayerfulness from one woman. And it has shown us that an aging and changing religious leader can still keep changing. And finally, it shows us the newborn light to the nation. Samuel. Now, I want to say at some point in this story, we can relate to one and maybe all of these characters. Uh, I, I hate to admit it, but there's a part of me as we're on the edge of Thanksgiving that thinks a little bit of the Thanksgiving day table when we're thinking about, you know, the uncle who's coming this year, maybe not this year, but maybe next year, who will make comments and we, we're thinking about the things that will throw us off, right? And we're thinking about others. But in this story, I want us to think about ourselves. I want us to think about the places we go to where the darkness of our soul emerges in the characters that we relate to. We learn what it looks like here to pour out our hearts before God. Have you ever done this? Have you ever poured out your heart before God? I mean it. Have you, have you gone so far into that space and place in your heart and your soul where you've lost all hope and the only one you turn to is left to turn to is God and you start talking and you start crying and you find yourself weeping before God wondering where you will find the strength for this moment and then the next moment. Have you ever gone there? I have. Thank you for helping me. He's going to help me preach a long time, I can tell. I have. I've been so low at times that I've found myself crying out to God as my very last resort. And I want to tell you, it's not long ago back then. It comes close to home now. While it should have been my first choice to turn to God, I found myself so brokenhearted that all I had left in my bag of resources was a broken heart cry, a tearful appeal, something that came from another place within me. 
Entering into the dark night of the soul can be frightening. Ask Juan de la Cruz, St. John of the Cross, author of The Dark Night of the Soul. He writes, no matter how much individuals go through, no, no matter how much individuals do through their own efforts, they cannot actively purify themselves enough to be disposed in the least degree for the divine union of the perfection of love. God must take over and purge them in that fire that is dark for them. That's what Hannah discovers. She finds that in the darkest night, when she engages the depth of her soul, that the hiddenness of God and God's love is revealed to her. Hannah's prayer is that God would grant her a child. Her promise to God is that she will grant this child back to him. God is not absent in any part of this story. There are parts of the story where God is hidden and then revealed, but God is present in it all. It is God's love emerging from the shadows that changes our hearts. Psychologist Carl Jung writes in his book, Symbols of Transformation, no one should deny the danger of the descent, but it can be risked. No one need risk it, but it is certain that someone will. And let those who go down the sunset way do so with open eyes, for it is a sacrifice which daunts even God. Yet every descent is followed by an ascent. The vanishing shapes are shaped anew, and a truth is valid in the end only if it suffers change and bears new witness in new images, in new tongues, like a new wine put into new bottles. Throughout the biblical narrative, we discover God arriving in the darkness of the night, in the darkness of the soul, in the times that seem like nothing is right, God appears to the humble, to the barren, to the distressed, to the distraught. Like the desert, the land that appears to be lifeless and dry, it's there that God arrives like the green oasis appearing out of nowhere. God makes a way in that wilderness and makes a way where there is no way. The person on the streets, the person in our home, the person in the mirror, the person in our neighborhood who, like Eli, is whispering to someone and we hear them and we say, oh, they must be crazy. They must be drunk. They must be beyond help. Maybe it's that they're in such deep grief they are so bereft, they are so brokenhearted, they are simply broken in two, that talking to God and crying to God and whispering to God is all they've got. They might be like Hannah, pouring out their hearts to God. I hope and pray that you hope and pray because when we pour our hearts out to God, we receive grace and peace. Yesterday, as we mourned and remembered Reverend Earl Fritz, his son John told the story of Earl climbing a 14,000 foot plus summit at the age of 75 years old. And Carl Jung's words were playing in my mind as I was listening to, to John speak. Those words became real in a whole new way. Every descent is followed by an ascent. From our highest days, our glorious peak climbing experiences, we eventually have to come down to earth. And we may find ourselves on the earth in the valley of the shadow of death. Likewise, when we sink down into the depths of despair, down into the darkness of the soul, we know that we will ascend we can climb out of that hole. We emerge out of the muck 
and we rise from the puddle that has formed under our eyes on the floor where we have been pouring our hearts out to God. With her prayer of the heart, Hannah goes right to the heart of the matter. Her name means grace in Hebrew, and there can be no mistaking that her prayer is a prayer of pure grace. In this prayer from grace, with grace, we hear that grace will return grace when grace is received. What a powerful image for prayer. How often in our prayers do we want something to happen for us? In our darkest nights, we want God's delivery service to come, to arrive with a neatly packaged answer. But how often do we return thanksgiving to God for that? When we get something, do we give something back? In Hannah's prayer, there is a trustful innocence. She doesn't adjust her prayer by asking God just to take away her sadness and her pain. She doesn't demand that God give her what she wants or else. She simply offers love to God and love is returned. At the center of Hannah's life is prayer and at the center of her prayer is trust in God. And at the center of God is love and grace. Hannah enters the fullness of love and grace and returns to God what has come from God. She gives her son back to God. The gift she has waited for her whole life, she gives back to God. She actually gives her son to Eli so that he may be in the temple in, at Shiloh with Eli and learn how to do what Eli has done. She gives her son to God, and with this gracious gift of life returned in thanksgiving to God, there is a seismic shift that happens in the nation. King David emerges from that seismic shift, and in time, Jesus is born from David's lineage, and then Jesus changes everything. Today, as Corey and Ben's answer to prayer, Jack Schwartz has been baptized into our faith in Christ. I pray that we pray like Hannah, like Hannah. I pray for you that your prayer goes to the heart of the matter that you're facing today. Don't get stuck on the edges of your prayer. Don't worry about your lack of decorum. Focus on your dedication to God. Give God thanks for all the blessings. Don't worry about how you look or how you sound when you are in your heartbroken state. God doesn't care about that. God only cares about you. That's all. So just pray. Go ahead and pour out your heart before God. God is waiting to hear from you.